Well, hello everyone. It is now four o'clock. I uh, hope that you've got either your ready-made drink to go or something because you're at home, you've brewed up something. Uh, we uh, also hope that you had enough time to put in a load of laundry or whatever else you're taking care of, or maybe just uh, cross the street if you're listening to this while you're walking along. My name is James Rush. I am the chapter of the Yongi the president of the Yongin chapter. Uh, it's been a long weekend. Um, actually, I, I see one of our friends has uh, put in there from Argentina. Uh, there's, a, there's an international conference that's happening down in Argentina. So I, I stayed up quite late last night uh, participating in that Zoom, uh, Zoom oriented. I didn't, didn't fly even though things are starting to open up. Uh, we do wanna give you a few heads up as to how this is gonna operate and in a really, awesome fashion. We actually have three presenters, three co-hosts, and so I'm going to let them do the majority of giving you the rules and, and what's going to happen with their presentation. But I just want to point out that uh, here in this session, we do abide by the Korea Tesla Code of Conduct. Uh, if you haven't uh, taken a look at that, please do. Uh, it's basically just be nice, uh, be respectful. And uh, as we are recording, uh, you probably heard this message in a few other sessions so far. If you don't want to be recorded, please keep your uh, screen off, your video off, as well as uh, maybe change your name uh, because um, we can't, we don't have the editing software to delete all that out. And, uh, but we do want to encourage participation. And so if you do uh, go ahead and turn on your video, that'd be very helpful for a bit of interaction between the presenters uh, myself and yourself. Uh, as we look at the rest of the session, uh, there is a mystery Easter egg uh, that will be revealed at some point uh, in the uh, probably about halfway through, maybe uh, heading towards the second half. But then also we have a time for not only question and answers at the end, but uh, for you to share. What are some of the ideas that you've come across, some of the apps and websites that you have found to be very helpful in your uh, time of going digital? So with that being said, I want to welcome Jamie, Rebecca, and Daryl. Show is yours. Okay, thank you so much, James. Um, so my name's Jamie, as you can see on the screen, um, and I will be starting off this pre presentation. Uh, just a little bit of background information, Rebecca, Daryl, and myself all work uh, at the University of Ulsan in South Korea. Um, that's kind of just a bit of our background. And just like I'm sure all of you, due to COVID, we had to get digital very fast in the past year or two. And we just want to have more of a discussion of certain apps and websites that we found that have really helped us along the way. Um, and as James kindly mentioned, at the end of the session, we would love to hear from you guys as well, if there's anything that you've found over the past few years or months um, that have really helped you in the classroom and especially helped your students. So we're going to be looking at uh, different skills that our students need, the challenges that we face as teachers, and then talking about our helpful resources. Okay, uh, so as I said, this is me, I'm Jamie, and um, the first skill that, uh, the skill that I'm going to be talking about is reading. Um, getting students to read is rather difficult these days and especially getting um, there's certain criteria that student needs needs to meet while they're studying. So from a basic level they need to be able to determine exactly what the text says. Then jumping up a few blocks they need to be able to evaluate an argument. And throughout their education, it will also be able to lead them to analyzing two or more texts um, in order to be able to compare and contrast. Now, the challenges that we often face with reading is the fact that most of our students uh, do not read nonfiction text. 
And there's a great challenge in finding high quality nonfiction texts that are appropriate for our learners. And that's kind of where I came across uh, New Zella. I found out about New Zella through some of my South African friends uh, who are also educators because just like me, they were having the same problem. And what is New Zella? It's basically an educational website that is focused on building students' reading comprehension. Um, and it provides a variety of high quality news articles with real time assessments. So let's just have a look at some of the topics that New Zealand can cover. There's uh, some sports, we've got science and maths, law, history, arts, fiction, um, opinion. So there really is a lot to choose from a lot of content and there's something for everyone on here um, and the great thing about New Zealand is that all of their articles come from really well-regarded media sources such as the Washington Post, Scientific America, uh, the Los Angeles Times and the Associated Press and so not only are your students going to be able to practice their reading comprehension, but they're also going to be able to stay up to date on global events, which I think is fantastic. Um, so while talking about New Zealand, I wanted to show you one article that I found and show you the different aspects of the website. Uh, so I chose uh, this article, Wanted an Orbiting Garbage Collector to Clean Up Space. Okay, so this is the article we're going to be looking at a little bit more. And the thing that New Zealand does is that it has four different reading or lexile levels. So here we have a comparison. So on the left, we have the lexile level, which they've deemed as max. And the reason they say it's max is because it's actually the original text. So if I just go back, you can see at the bottom, this article was written by Rachel Feltman from the Washington Post. So her original article will be deemed as max on the New Zealand website. But on the right-hand side, you have a lexile level of 380. So this is the lowest lexile level um, that you're, you can find on New Zealand. And how they create these articles is the New Zealand staff take the original and start to rewrite them according to um, a Lexile level conversion chart. And so let's just have a look at these two bottom paragraphs. So the first sentence for the max Lexile level, the original article, it says the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, estimates that there are about 23,000 pieces of space debris larger than 10 centimeters or about four inches. Now, if I take a look at the right, this, the last paragraph says, satellites do not work forever though. And they do not all return to earth when they stop working. Many keep speeding through the sky. Sometimes they crash. The mach machines break into small pieces. The pieces are called space debris. Debris is another word for junk. So you can clearly see that this is a very different reading level for your students. It is the same content, just at a different reading level. And as a teacher on New Zealand, you are able to set the reading level for your students. And with the quizzes, the assessments that come along with each article, after about eight to 10 quizzes, the site will start to adjust your students' lexa, uh, sorry, adjust the articles according to your students' lexile level. So the site will actually show 
the progress that your students are making as they read and then take the assignments along with it. So as I said, you're covering the same content, but the material will be suited to each student's individual reading level. As I mentioned, uh, I've already mentioned the quizzes, but I do want to point out that there are some real-time assessments with uh, each quiz. Um, so you can choose a multiple choice quiz, or there are also writing prompts that go along with each article. So each article has about a four part quiz, which focuses on what the text says, central ideas, uh, word meaning and choice, text structure, point of view, uh, and arguments and claims. And these will all be presented alongside your article. So your students will be able to look back at the article while doing the assessment to find the evidence. And all of the assessments are aligned to the common core anchor standards for reading. Okay, so there are some different tools within uh, Newzella. The first tool that they have is a built-in annotation tool. So both students and teachers can highlight passages, mark certain areas with symbols, uh, ask questions and jot notes. This creates an active reading experience for your students that will allow them to further their comprehension. Uh, New Zealand also has something called text sets. And these are collections of articles with a similar topic, theme, or standard. Now, this will help to build your students' background knowledge and vocabulary around those certain topics or themes. And the great thing about this is, is that you can create your own text sets, and you can also use the text sets that have been created by other educators on the platform. So there are many, many text sets that are already available to you. The other tool that I find quite useful on Newzella is called a binder. Also, once again, for both students and teachers. Um, this is where you can store and collect all assessment and assignment related info. Now, with Newzella, it is free to register. And with the free version, you are able as a teacher to view the classroom level of data. So you're able to see the number of students who have completed an assignment and the class average. But with the free version, you cannot view individual uh, students' data or their responses to the writing prompts. That is all combined in New Zella Pro. So that's the version that you would need to pay for. Probably the biggest benefits of New Zella Pro is that uh, teachers not only can view the classroom level data, but they are also able to view individual students' progress. Um, they can see individual quiz results, they can read and score and provide feedback on students' responses to writing prompts. And they are also able uh, to edit the writing prompt. So you can customize the writing prompt so that it would align more closely to what you're covering in class. Um, with the free version, as I said, you can annotate the text, so can your students. But with Musella Pro, you would be able to view and respond to your students' annotations. Students would be able to respond in, to any questions that you put on the article, and you can also respond to their questions. So for the most part, I've, I've personally never uh, bought the pro version. I found that at least for the needs that I've had with while teaching in Korea, the free version is more than enough. But if you are really looking to uh, 
use New Zealand as a place to assess your students, I definitely think the pro version uh, would be beneficial for you. Um, and now how to use New Zealand in a classroom. Sorry, let me jump out of that. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is, so this, we're actually looking at the New Zealand uh, page now, and this is under their support system. So if I went here and I go down to support and I click getting started, it would take me to here. And what these are, are different rollout plans that would connect New Zealand to other apps, to other platforms. So as you can see, we have um, the Google Classroom, Clever, uh, Classlink, Canvas, Schoolology. Um, yeah. So these are the different uh, platforms that New Zealand is able to partner with. And within each grouping, you would get instructions for, uh, for the admin. So the admin at your school uh, are able to download this packet here, which would explain how to prepare all the teachers at your school for using New Zealand and how to use the rollout kits. It also includes an email template. So you are able to um, send the teachers a already made email about New Zealand as well as their instructions, so how they can personally use it in their classroom. So they've done majority of the set work, set up uh, work for you already, which is fantastic. Um, and how, how would I be using New Zealand personally in my classroom? So what I've done in the past is um, I've used it to provide background knowledge in preparation for certain classroom activities, but especially for discussions. So I can send my students home with work, or I can give them the link and assign them the article. Um, and my students are able to read the same content. And when they return to class, we're able to have a discussion on the same content, even though they may have read the articles at different Lexile levels. Um, the other way that you could possibly use New Zealand is to supplement novels or other literature. It can supply you with additional info on the subject or um, historical context. Uh, the other way that I thought about applying New Zealand in the classroom is to ask a student to select an article, any article. If I go to the home page in a moment while it's loading. So this is the home page for New Zealand. You can see you've got many, many options as well as different topics on the side, also offered in Spanish. So you could ask a student to select an article that interests them and present the article, uh, discuss the article to the class. So that would not only further their reading comprehension, but also strengthen their speaking skills as well. New Zealand also contains articles uh, that discuss both sides of uh, possibly controversial issues. You could use this as a basis for persuasive or opinion writing, uh, discussions and debates, and practice comparing and contrast different uh, authors' points of view. So ultimately, why do I like this app? Well, I like to read and I do think our student, students benefit a lot from reading. And it is very difficult to find nonfiction texts that my students would be interested in. And here it is all on one platform. It's interactive, it's engaging. My students are able to read online, interact with them and interact with the text. Um, they're also able to assess their own comprehension through assignments and actively track their own progress. Uh, they can explore what interests them, so they could even be compelled to read outside of, outside of class. And I do feel that this website provides a place where if you're teaching online or if you're teaching in person, this can still apply to you and this can still be used. And the transition between in-person or online class would be very minimal. 
and uh, not very disruptive to your students at all. So yeah, this was my uh, website that uh, I decided to choose for today. And yeah, I would love to hear from our next speaker, Rebecca. Alrighty, thank you, Jamie. All right, so hello everyone. I'll go ahead and share my little screen. As you can see, we're keeping up with the, the dog theme here. And this is my little sister pup, my sister's puppy, Ferdinand. So, um, so today I want to talk about what I think is important for our students to be able to survive in a 21st century, not only classroom, but in this entire world. I see that there's a shift in our skills today. And what I thought about for our skills is not only do I want to create a student that will succeed in a classroom, but a, stu a student that will succeed in the future. So what skills can I help them get in a classroom that are transferable in the future? And that's kind of challenging to think about because times are changing so fast. It's kind of hard to know what skills will be needed in the next 10, 15 years. So I really reflected on this and I thought to myself, well, what will always be needed? And I think it comes down to communication and the ability to change, the flexibility and adaptability. So I found a quote that I found um, to be really helpful with this idea. Curriculum instruction and learning environments must be aligned to produce a support system that will lead to the 21st century outcomes for today's students. So I feel like it's our mission as educators to give our students not only language skills, but how can we help them apply this into our everyday lives. So today I will be talking about band and how this can be a sourceful, a useful resource for teachers and um, I'll go ahead and get started here with some of the challenges that I've experienced. Um, first of all, I think it has to do with just being technologically savvy and navigating um, websites. Like, what do I do with this website? How do I navigate it? Do, am I literate enough to understand the layout? I know for me personally, when I started to um, use this website, it did take me a few days to kind of get the feel of what I could be doing with my students. And a fear for me was if it's taken me a couple of days to kind of just feel comfortable, how is that going to translate to my students? It's a learning curve, not only for us, but I think for everyone with the shift of virtual classrooms really requires everyone to get comfortable and really put our technological skills to the test. And so while that is a bit intimidating for some, even for me, we're always learning, but um, this was something that I found really useful in our classroom. Now our school does provide an online platform for us, but I wanted to find something that went a little bit beyond and something that was already there and something that was familiar with our students. Um, so band seemed to be something that was well, well versed with some students. So that helped with some of the challenges. But on top of that, another challenge that I've realized is how do we get students to use the language effectively, not only in a classroom, but outside. And I think that was one of my goals overall. And I think for all educators is getting the students to talk but also making the, dis the difference between speaking and communicating. Um, students are exposed to English at a very young age here in Korea and they know it, but can they use it? And, you know, they go, teacher, teacher, I'm so nervous. I can't speak well. And it comes down to practicing, not just in class, but outside. So finding ways and getting creative to get the students exposed to the language um, was one of those things that wanted that helped me to encourage them. Um, student burnout is real. A lot of students, they're overwhelmed with school and work. 
So the last thing that they want to do is think in a different language. And I empathize with them because we're all we're all working and it's quite exhausting and learning a language is not an easy task. Um, but that's just part of the reality and we have to practice in order to improve. Um, but another thing that I've started to realize too, when you're working with young adults and the older your students get, saving face becomes an issue, well, not an issue, but it's just becoming something that you don't really realize until you're in that moment. And I've had a couple of students who are quite on the older side and how do I, how is that interaction with the teacher and somebody who's older and saving face? And it, learning a language can be a very childlike experience for some, even though that they are learning um, the language probably for a second time. And so also keeping that in mind with our students. So it's finding ways to get our students to feel motivated, feel safe in an, an environment that, you know, promotes that. And I think it's all down, it comes down to exposure and just playing with language and trying to make it fun. Um, so BAN has been a nice little resource for me. Um, so with that, I wanna talk a little bit about you know, navigating that. Um, the first thing about Band, it's not only just a website, but it's an app as well. And I actually got really excited when I found this on my phone. Um, and I found this, the smaller and the less disruptive the electronic device, the bigger the chance it has of becoming a lifelong learning tool for anyone, anywhere, at any time. So the accessibility is a nice key point for students and it's easy for them to access the classroom anywhere. So it's easy to hopefully encourage them and want to learn. And then the layout also has more of a social media like feel to it. So not only are you creating a classroom but it kind of makes it feel more like a community. There's a lot of things that you can do on here. You can post, um, information, you can create assignments through posts, add pictures, videos, attachments, quizzes. So um, online learning right here, I said, it says online learning digital platforms help learners create learning communities where they can construct knowledge and share it with others. So I think the best kind of learning happens within each other. I know as a student, for me, I did not like speaking up. I always got nervous. Saving face for me also kicked in. So there was that, um, you know, that empathy that you start to really realize when you're on the other side of the classroom. So um, online, having an online presence really gets you to feel more comfortable taking the teacher out of the picture to some extent is a nice and also this is a pretty good way of exposure, uh, getting exposed to different channels of communication. If you really wanted to take it a level further, depending on your level of class, um, there's different levels of formality. When you're talking to a person via text, email, um, post and videos, you can also kind of give students a little introduction on how you can use that in a, the context um, how communication changes. And I think that's going to be vital, especially as um, the world is globalizing and telecommunication is going to be a really important thing for our students here, at least in Korea. I know that looking for international jobs is something that they look for. So having that and knowing a little bit of the rules and just kind of getting used to the layout. And this is where adapt adaptability comes into just being tech savvy, being able to use that language in that environment. I got ahead of myself. So I actually wanna go ahead and show you a little tutorial here. Oh, let's see here. All right. Let me go ahead and give me one second. I had it open. And this is how um, the band layout looks like. So you have different bands, which are essentially groups and you can control your classroom. So what you would essentially do is you would create a band and depending on your purpose, 
For us, it would be an online classroom. And then you can enter in your own info, class one, class two, I have another one. So I'm gonna use class three. And then just pick a picture that you like. And you have the ability to make it private, list the group, or you could make it public for anyone. So I use private with my students. And this is what it looks like. It kind of ha it has your typical wall social media feel. So um, I think it's pretty fun. And I hope that it encourages my students to want to participate more. And you can do so much here. You can post pictures. You can add stickers. You can add um, videos. You can even go live. I've never used live before. But having options is nice. I think this is fairly new, adding quizzes. I haven't done this before. But when I used it, I don't think that was there. Um, so there's just so much room for flexibility here. Let me go ahead. I'm going to go back to my PPT. So another honorable mention that I wanted to take a moment and just talk about is Padlet as well. And Padlet is somewhat a learning environment for your students. This is something that I just discovered a couple weeks ago. So I just wanted to show you that it's a pretty great website and you can have students do vocabulary. Um, you can have them record. I had my students do some voice recording to focus on stress. So that was pretty cool. So Padlet um, gives you a lot of room for um, uploading, sharing links, cameras. So um, hopefully you find that website quite helpful. So overall, I'll go ahead and end it in a moment right here, but um, using band is pretty helpful. It meets the needs of students at all levels, especially the older that your students are getting, it might be multi-levels and it takes, they're taking more initiative in their own learning. And it motivates students to want to learn more. And I think that's a key compo component when it comes to language learning. And it overall just fosters their communication skills, um, just being online, communicating with each other, teamwork. I think everyone is able to learn from each other. So um, with that said, I hope that you find uh, these resources really helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and edit there. And Rebecca, may I ask for a moment? Off. Um, yeah. I noticed on band there was an area for interests or clubs, right? Oh, yes. So do you think there would be like a, a dead poet society possibly made in that kind of space where an Easter egg oh. appeared? Yeah, yeah. I, if anybody is curious about, yeah, um, I'm sure that the there is a space for the dead poet society in the just click on that interest. Yes. Cool. All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll let you continue on and transition over to, to Daryl. And uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me go take it from here. Uh, just once again, thank you everyone for, for joining us. I'm the final speaker. Uh, this is uh, my bottomless pit, Nunu. Uh, she's in Ireland waiting for me this Christmas. So um, I'm going to talk about screencasting and uh, feedback, video feedback. So first, just to define the terms, what is screencasting? Um, we have a definition here, capturing the actions performed on computer, including mouse movements and clicks on web browser links. It's basically an audio visual tool. Um, from there, I'd like to talk about uh, why, why I'm interested in it and why I came up with my uh, teaching experience so far um, from the pandemic. So at University of Wilson, um, both Jamie, Rebecca and I are teaching English communication, speaking courses, presentation modules, uh, credit and non-credit courses. It's 100% online. 
Um, all of our lessons are via Zoom and we have uh, no face-to-face -face contact at all. So uh, we've mostly never met any of our students, even though we are here in Ulsan. Um, so supplementary tools to engage the learner outside of the lesson and written feedback. These were the things I was uh, focused on mostly because the live lessons were a little hard to gauge how much our students were um, understanding our lessons, content and instructions more so. So from that, I um, became interested in, in screencasting and supplementing my lessons with uh, further video instructions and feedback um, and hence screencasting. So what I've been using it for so far is uh, things like outlining the syllabus to students, having uh, shown them and uploading it already, you're never too sure if they are totally with you, with your instructions. So I used to make uh, videos to follow up with that using the screencast uh, programs. Um, reviewing script writing for a presentation course. Um, this helped me to really focus on um, actually the, lo the lower level learners and the more challenging um, uh, lessons where students maybe missed the point or the instruction or, or my instruction wasn't as clear so I could delve into that with more personal and um, more um, I could spend more time giving feedback to particular students uh, example presentations I could use the the tool to show them visually what I was looking for in terms of a presentation and the style and just outlining outlining uh, presentation grading rubrics. Um, so I've used it mostly to supplement most of my course and to um, have um, video documents for students to visit and review again and again, as much as they'd like to help with uh, understanding as I never really get to see them face to face. Uh, so using the tool, I chose Screencast-O-Matic I'm just going to share now the website itself and a how to use on YouTube. So this is a free to use uh, screencasting tool. Um, if you sign in, you just you can you can uh, sign up uh, for free. And if you do, you can use the actual um, the website's um, um, memory uh, link. So you can you can save videos on that website itself on the account. They gave you, they give you free uh, data and gigabytes, so you can use their um, uh, cloud in itself. Also, uh, the home screen is really easy to use. As soon as you sign up, you essentially just click this icon video and you are ready to start. Um, from there, this, this will pop up on your screen and you can choose the preference of the size. You can check your audio and the max time is 15 minutes. Um, you can extend that, of course, with a pro version if you'd like to pay, which you don't really have to. I think the the limiting time has uh, it's almost like a phenomenon here with with um, uh, websites or apps like Snapchat, where less is more. Uh, of course, Twitter, and in this instance, yeah, you're limited to fifteen minutes, which has actually helped me in being a bit more brief and getting to the point clear uh, quickly when I know that there's a time limit. Of course, I can do multiple videos, and sometimes that's helpful, part one and part two, but knowing that I have a limit as well is actually helps me to be more uh, succinct and precise with my instruction. Um, so how, how it works when, as soon as you're finished your video, you press stop, there is the editing tool here. It's there ready for you, and you can save it straight to your desktop, you can save it to the website, as I said before, Screencast-O-Matic. It can go, you can link your YouTube, it goes straight there, or to Google Drive. This is um, a little bit different from Zoom itself, where it usually goes straight to my browser. Um, whereas if my students are connected with my drive, it just goes straight in there. So sometimes it's a little, little issues like ease of use, where you can catch students. Um, and it, it kind of shows where this tool is a bit more useful. I mean, Skype itself would have been uh, a no-brainer for, um, for lessons, online lessons, 
at the beginning of the pandemic, but Zoom really overtook it by having a very uh, intuitive uh, option of having breakout rooms. So this one for me, instead of using Zoom, I used the screencast because it was just a little bit easier. One step easier for me was good enough to use the free uh, program. Um, other studies. So usually theory can inform practice or vice versa. So I was curious myself how it's been used or how it's been um, uh, researched in other papers and journals. So um, uh, engaging the visual and auditory senses has been demonstrated to enhance student learning, of course, to increase our audio visual um, tools when we're communicating with students, I think is always a benefit. Um, some of these, um, some research I've, I was looking at with Thompson 2012, they used a class of 30 students. Uh, it was a writing course college level writing courses, and they use screencasting, screencast-o-matic, in fact, to do feedback from the, from the lecturers. And it was purported to help them a lot. The main point I took from that article was, from that journal, was it helped students to incorporate the big picture changes. So usually when we're giving feedback, written feedback, we do like to focus on the small edits that we can help them with. We don't have so much time to really expand on what we're, uh, an overall picture of maybe some writing assignments. In this one, you have more time in your video feedback to talk about issues other than small edits, maybe even rewrites or structural things in a personal way. Um, so another thing is when you are conscious of sending personal feedback to students, it can feel more conversational and it might make students feel a bit more comfortable because it's, it feels more personable that you're communicating with students one-to-one, uh, -one, but in an online space. Um, so another study, oh, pardon me, Another study came out of uh, Montana State University. Um, this shows the variety of uses for screencasting and feedback where students were um, learning a course in library book classification systems. Seems quite, um, quite finicky. And there's a, there's a universal system called the Dewey system where in the module itself, this using this system was proved to be quite challenging from an online space where the instructor was trying to explain all the steps to students. Um, from the course, this was the area where students fell down the most. So a screencasting, um, an extra screencasting class was created by some instructors called Dewey Screencasts, where they just delved into the Dewey system by itself, where students volunteered to take those extra courses or video courses and purported to have been highly effective in helping them to guide them through that course. Um, looking beyond uh, simply uh, English language learning, um, it was used for uh, calculus teaching. Again, when there's some very specific or uh, high challenging level issues, it can be used to really zo zone in and spend more time outside of a live lesson to really focus on on that on problems or potential problems and finally screencasting oh not yes finally a uh, study out of ireland uh, from dundalk in a, uh, institute um, it was a small scale using online survey surveys and focus groups where students were making e-portfolios and the lecturer used screencasting to send feedback one-to-one -one on all students and help them with modifications and edits as well on that. Um, that research involves surveys and focus groups where, a student, uh, where students could um, give their feedback on the uh, use of audiovisual tools like screencasting. Results were uh, positive enough. Screencast feedback was clear and easy to follow. So uh, the majority of students were in favor and uh, agreed with the statements. And the one I found interesting as always, the challenges with new tools and new technology, I found it easy to access the screencast feedback. Um, 
not that many students. So that was a lower number. So this kind of brings me along to the benefits and challenges of using tools as such as screencasting. So benefits, what I've seen so far in my personal experience and from research, uh, you can use communication that is conversational. When you know you're talking to a student one-to-one, -one, you may use more conversational language. When teaching multilingual speakers, which of course happens so much in uh, um, EFL, ESL, um, teachers might find that reading sentences aloud model standard English. When we are reading things verbatim, it might help us uh, lose the thick Irish accent that I exhibit sometimes. Um, a sense of reader's experience through visual uh, imagery and analogies. Of course, uh, audiovisual learners uh, really benefit from this. Feedback can be conversational and personalized, as I spoke about before. And of course, they have the option of watching and rewatching the instruction and, the, uh, and listening to the feedback. Um, challenging material can be explained in more depth if you don't if you're not afforded so much time during live lessons and students can get the bigger picture from more detailed feedback. Of course, with the benefits, there are many challenges um, access. So all of this is to benefit the learner. And if students are not in a position where Internet access is readily available and high quality, uh, this is really letting them down. So a challenge would be making these extra supplementary lessons and students not being able to access it. That is never what we want from uh, assisting with our learners. IT skills as well, of course, um, we all had to get very tech savvy very quickly, some quicker than others, and we're always still learning and upskilling. And if others are still not on the page with with the progress, then it's it's leaving behind students where it shouldn't. Timing, both for the lecture and the learners, um, it is extra supplementary um, teaching and instruction. Of course, we don't have an infinite time to send personal feedback all the time through video, uh, through screencasting. So uh, it is something that, although sounds um, on par positive, um, it is a lot of time for us and the learners to watch our extra lesson and reliance on feedback over lives. So sometimes we might feel comfortable where we can rely on just making videos to explain something and not focusing still on trying to make the point clearly in our live lessons or our original lessons. Um, so that brings me to the end. Um, so yeah, this is our opportunity now for um, any questions, comments on Newzela from Jamie or from any of the points from band from Rebecca and anything from the session. And thank you very much everyone for listening. Definitely. Uh, I am I am very comfortable with and I believe our panelists are very comfortable with also as far as just open mic. Uh, there's only 15, 17 of us. Uh, well, it looks like the, the session is getting a little bit larger, maybe preparing for our next uh, speaker. But um, uh, we do want to give time for the question and answer. And if there were any apps or websites and things that were uh, found to be beneficial in your classrooms, uh, this is kind of the the open session that the panelists wanted to, they wanted to hear your ideas so that we can kind of put this all into one space and place. I saw that uh, Anik had asked if we would be using this going forward within our classrooms, if any of us, and I definitely think that New Zealand is something that I would want to use. Um, I, I think I value reading a lot. Reading's very important to me. I think uh, students can pick up a lot of knowledge through reading. Um, so I think no matter what I teach, uh, I do think I would probably continue using that website. Yep. And um, could one of you reshare the title screen? Uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, get as many of the uh, 
uh, people that are showing their faces on here as possible, but then also the title screen for the thing. I didn't get, I didn't grab a screenshot for uh, to start things off. So, okay. But I believe I'm going to stop the recording, so we don't have to record that part of it. But so thanks everybody for the closing of the recording, and then stick around for a picture.